Today, as we open your word and turn our attention to its power, its majesty, to the truth therein revealed, to the absolute assurance of our heavenly hope in your holy revealed word, I pray that you would write upon our souls that we may not soon forget, but add to our faith more understanding and encouragement in the walk that you've called us to. Lord, as we turn to the pages of our forebears, thousands of years ago, even Joseph, who followed your will and ruled on your behalf, I pray whatever you call us to, Lord, that we, we would learn from the testimony of the saints who've gone before and by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that we too can walk in obedience and faith as we look to your word and as we follow your instructions. Lord, I pray that you would encourage the saints and that you would convict the sinners today as we listen to your word and that through this you would be glorified and your church would be equipped and armored for the battles ahead. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> this morning we turn to the scriptures and continue in our series in Genesis 43, following the account of Joseph. The title of this morning's message is Joseph's Rule and Reign. I'll just reach back a little ways to chapter 37 to give us a context for this title. It was an incredulous response that the brothers first gave Joseph when he told them of his dream of 11 sheaves bowing before his own. They didn't like that idea. They understood immediately what it meant, and they rejected it out of hand. 37, 7, Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, Joseph says, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Listen to what his brothers said, verse 8. Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? They asked this question with unbelief and resentment. Rebellion against God's purposes and hatred for their brother. Well, their question was answered, is answered in the course of the story. And in Genesis 43, the yes could not be more unequivocal. Joseph's rule and reign is documented through the duration of the book of Genesis. And now the brothers are themselves fulfilling these words in chapter 37. The aim of this morning's message is to examine the rule and reign of Joseph in our text today and in that examination to expound the connections between the rule of Joseph and the rule of Jesus Christ. We've mentioned this several times, but Joseph, as many other figures of the Old Testament, serve in part to give us an expectation of what the Messiah would be, sometimes by reflection, especially in Joseph's case, other times in contrast. The Old Testament and its narratives prepare us for the glories of the Messiah and His rule and reign. And I submit that our passage today is no exception. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word out of reverence this morning? And let us consider this document as we continue with the second half of Genesis 43. We'll be reading verses 26 through 34. Listen to God's holy word as it is proclaimed in your ears today. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well? And the old man, the old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well, and he is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. And Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother. And he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. They served him by himself and them by themselves. And the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Thirty-four portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. This is the word of God. You may be seated. <clears throat> I 
As we referenced a moment ago in Genesis 37, verse 8, Moses, the author of this book, the first in the canon and of the Pentateuch, Moses records the incredulous, that is, unbelieving reaction and resentful reaction, dismissive of Joseph's brothers when he shares his dream of his family sheaves, 11, representing his brothers, of course, bowing before his own. Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? What an absurd thought they spitefully responded. The narrator, Moses, further records, so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Unbeknownst to his brothers at that time in the record, the rule and re- or at this time in the record, now forward, moving forward some 22 years, the rule and reign of Joseph is firmly established. The prophecy has absolutely come to pass. pass. The brothers acknowledge as much, again, unwittingly, as they again, the second trip to Egypt, Upon their second trip to Egypt, bow low. So low, in fact, they're laying on the ground before the second in command of the storehouses that hold out hope and provision during the famine. This time, all 11 of them, all of them right down to Benjamin himself, are present at Joseph's house and table. And and, uh, Joseph's plan, as he interacts with his family, again, as we've seen in the text before, is to test them and to use his influence in such a way as to bring his brothers to test where their hearts are at. And God uses this to bring them to repentance and contrition and ultimately to reunite the covenant family. So here they are once again before him after 22 years of estrangement. And Joseph's plan in this regard and the way that these circumstances are designed so far as he had control, I submit serves as an analogy of the providential sovereignty of God. Just as Joseph ordered the affairs, knowing who his brothers were, they did not know as much as he did. So God orders our affairs, our affairs. God is omniscient. We are limited. There's an analogy there. The providential sovereignty of God organizes things in such a way, similarly, that we might be moved to be reconciled to him, to be convicted of our own sins, and to be softened in our own hearts, and to be drawn closer together to Christ and to his family. The brothers are moved through these events to honor their father and to bow in humble submission before their brother. Though the brothers were subject in part to the will of Joseph, this proved to be in their best interest. What they scoffed at before was now drawing them to a place of closer relationship to the Lord. The kindness, the mercy of our God is evident in this, as well as his sovereign hand. Proved to be in their best interests as Joseph provides for them trials leading to repentance and salvation from famine through his abundant storehouses of food. The the brothers were graciously captive to the favor and intentions of the Lord of the land. And if Jesus is your Lord and you are a slave to Christ and to righteousness, that could be said of you as well. You are graciously captive to the favor and intentions of the Lord of Lords. In, such, in days such as our own, this is obviously a, a thought that just like Joseph's brothers of old, most people scoff at because radical autonomy is celebrated as the chief value or one of them of our day. What is radical autonomy? It's self-will. It's I can do what I want, when I want, Thank you. I'm in control of my situation and my destiny. My decisions are are preeminent, and I won't suffer anyone to take my idea of self-worth, self-identity, and self-will from me. That is what I'm going to cling to, the modern pagan man says, with white-knuckled commitment. So in a day where where radical autonomy is valued above almost everything else, and where the notion of submission is nearly universally rejected in the attitudes of our culture, the account of Joseph teaches us important lessons. The grace of submission to the Lord. Just as the grace of guilt had led the brothers to confession of sin and softened their hearts, so it's changing them from the inside out, this narrative sets up an important question in the biography of the covenant family, which might be framed like this. Which is more preferable? First, one, or A, when the brothers lived according to their own whims 
Inflicting resentment fueled abuse upon Joseph. So which is more preferable? Getting to live by your own whims or B, submitting to the authority and mercy of the Lord and underneath him their brother, now serving as grand steward of Egypt. Well, at the time of Joseph's dream, they didn't know what was good for them. But now it is proven to be the case that God would bring salvation through the family line ultimately in Jesus. And he would preserve that line by means of supply during times of privation and famine. He would do this through Jesus, the very life and livelihood and spiritual life, uh, so to speak, of this entire plan of God depended on the obedience and the placement of Joseph as a servant of the Lord at this time. There's a lesson here for us. We cannot see the big picture. In spite of the arrogance that presumes we know enough, we don't. Only God who sees all and knows all, both the inward uh, posture of our heart, the inner recesses of our motivations, and the untold, the innumerable, the, uh, and the infinite uh, facts of history, future even, only one who knows and coordinates and understands and wills all things to his glory is to be trusted and ultimately can give us direction that we need. The scriptures say this in many ways. The Proverbs echo the same, do they not, when they say, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, trust in the Lord. Acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Well, the Lord was doing this with the brothers of Joseph in kind of a mandatory way. He was forcing them. He was compelling them graciously, albeit, and lovingly and patiently, albeit. He was compelling them to not lean on their own understanding, which would reject and sell their brother into slavery, but to lean on him who through that very brother, their uh, whole family would be saved. So there's a royal communion feast, I submit, that's going on here. And that's, I think, a way to see this that draws in some pictures that encompasses the rest of the gospel and major themes in scripture. A royal communion event is what's happening here. The Lord of the land is extending favor and table fellowship to the brothers as they visit. So what is revealed in this royal communion feast? Three things this morning to organize our text. Number one, the unconditional submission of the brothers. This royal communion situation reveals unconditional submission. Number two, this royal communion reveals in Joseph a shepherd king. Continue to see the character and rule of Joseph as a shepherd of sorts. We'll expound on that. And number three, this royal communion reveals sovereign privilege. That is the sovereign privilege of Joseph so far as this situation pictures. First of all, royal communion revealing unconditional submission. 26. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present they had had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. So notice the situation. And perhaps you can get in your mind's eye a sense of the context. I asked the kids last night in family worship, what kind of house do you suppose Joseph lived in? Now, imagine the circumstances we know a bit uh, from the uh, story of Joseph arising, messianic ascension as we've called it, from the pit of imprisonment to a place of prominence and authority second in command in Egypt. Along the way, he is honored and heralded and he is affirmed and commended by the Pharaoh as the one whom the entire land should look to for their future to be secured during times of coming famine. After, of course, he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. So he was honored by a change of clothes and a royal ceremony. He was given that chariot and that parade to victoriously introduce him to everyone in the land. And then they showed their submission to Pharaoh's will and Joseph's as they bowed before him. So all this adds up, if you put two and two together, that Joseph probably lived in a pretty nice house, a palace. Have you seen some of those documentaries of Egypt around the time of Joseph? It's amazing. You have towering stone pillars that reach into the sky. You have walls carved with the hieroglyphs of generations and generations of the legacy of these ruling kings. You have the sphinxes and the temples and the pyramids and the aqueducts and all of this magnificence around him. Now imagine that you're a tent dweller. You're a nomad from Canaan. You've never known a permanent home in your life. And here you are gathered, waiting for the Lord of the land. You don't know it's your brother. Second in command, those towering stone pillars reaching over your head. And you're talking among, amongst one another in hushed tones. It's echoing off the walls of this stone palace. It seems loud and you lower your voices in a whisper still because it seems 
that the uncertainty of the situation, what might happen when this man arrives and who are we to be here, all is building a sense of nervousness, fear, and suspense. Where is Joseph at this time? Well, he's likely commanding and directing in his great provision, you know, administration. This food is to be directed there. He's likely meeting with kings, perhaps from Babylon and Assyria and Sumerians from the north. And he's saying, here are my storehouses. And he's, he's directing all of these administrative international foreign relations decisions with all the nations of the known world. And then at the close of his workday, which consists of this kind of activity, he arrives at the house. And here you are. Your money has been returned in your sacks. You don't know if, it was, if you were framed as a result of this uh, for, for stealing. You have dirty clothes and dirty feet and donkey's brain hungry in the background. And you have your tattered clothing, a long journey. The sweat and dust have clinging to your brow. And Joseph came home. And what's in their hand at this time? Well, what's in their hand only accentuates the picture that I just gave. They have a small and pitiful gift. It's the fruit, the choice fruits of the land that Jacob had told them to gather. Take from the choice fruits of the land in your bags a present and bring it down to the man, he had said in 40, uh, chapter 43 Verse 11, a little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. So perhaps this little package divided between this 11 brothers are standing there pitifully waiting with this small gift to the one who owns all the food in the whole world virtually waiting for him to arrive. These, quite obviously, are unworthy subjects. Their unconditional submission to Joseph only makes sense because they have nothing to stand on and nothing really to offer. Under these conditions, all they had to offer could not rise above the level of pitiful insult given the situation. Again, given the situation, all they had to offer could not rise above the level of pitiful insult. Imagine it. Oh, you're going to bring me a handful of pistachios? after selling me into slavery for 22 years ago? Oh, you think a little gum and myrrh is going to make up for the bereavement of a father having lost his favored son two decades ago? You think that some pistachios can atone for selling me into slavery? I was held against my will in chains, clasped upon my neck and ankles, drug away to a foreign land, then framed for attempted rape and thrown in prison? This is a pitiful insult, just on the face of it. That was not Joseph's response, but that was certainly where his brothers stood. They were unworthy subjects. Yet, and, but because of this situation and how obvious it was to them and how God had sovereignly ordered this, the, this, the affairs, they knew it. Is this not how God brings us to true repentance and faith in the gospel? We realize that we are pitiful in, our death and, uh, in the death of our sin, in the dirtiness of our soul, and the unworthiness to stand before holy God. We are unworthy subjects. Everything that we have to offer the Lord when we come to the cross cannot rise above the level of a pitiful insult. I love the words of the Rock of Ages, that uh, one of the verses which... Um, reads as follows, Nothing in my hands is I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. That's how we come to Jesus, if we are sincere and uh, if our rebirth and regeneration is legitimate. We realize that we are unworthy subjects, have nothing to bring. And like Joseph's brothers, we stand there dirty from the journey of sin and guilty of rebellion against him, the condemnation of an innocent man. We mentioned earlier in this chapter how the brothers recount in the grace of guilt, or maybe it's the previous one, how Joseph at one time was subject to the rule of his brothers. 
At one time, when they were exerting their power over him, Joseph's only defense in that, well, he was thrown into the pit and so forth, his only defense was to appeal to the conscience of his abusers. And now Joseph rules and Joseph reigns. The tables have utterly turned. But notice that Joseph reigns according to the rule and reign more like Jesus Christ, not as a selfish tyrant, caring nothing for the law of God. But the dramatic turn of events uh, demonstrates that Joseph now has utter power over his brothers, just like they once had over him. And now, as a result, their only defense, his brother's only defense, is to appeal to the mercy of their judge. They appeal to his mercy, just like we do when we come to Calvary. On the mercy, on the mercy of the sacrifice you provide, may we have communion with you. This meal began also with the slaughter, with the sacrifice. In verse 16, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. It strikes me as a gospel parallel that without a slaughter of a substitute sacrifice, no royal communion with the Lord is possible, just as this meal pictured here. Why? Because we are unworthy subjects, pitiful in our sin. Second thing, under unconditional submission, we see unmistakable fulfillment. <clears throat> Joseph came in, they bring this present, and the very next thing they do after offering their pitiful gift is they bow to him on the ground. And then verse 28 continues in this way. They said, your servant, giving an account of their father's welfare, is well, he is alive. And they bowed their heads, and now they lay down, they prostrate themselves on the ground. Ten before, and now all eleven a more precise fulfillment still of that dream in chapter 37, an unmistakable fulfillment of prior prophecy. The dream they so despise and the absurd notion of bowing before their brother in chapter 37 has come true. And it's come true a second time and even more precisely now. And it will continue to demonstrate itself. That, that is the fulfillment of this prophecy throughout the course of the rest of the book of Genesis. To give uh, an idea of how unmistakable this fulfillment is, turn with me uh, to, I said that, by the way, this is 17 years later, a few chapters um, down uh, along the line, and we see in chapter 50, as the book begins to draw to a close, the brothers are once again pleading the mercy, um, at the mercy of Joseph. Verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead. They said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. 17 years later, plus 22, whatever that is, do the math. Now, at this time, the brothers are still acknowledging the unmistakable fulfillment of Joseph's dreams and the fact that they are unworthy subjects. And now that Joseph's gone, they figure maybe the will of our father was the last thing that stood between him and what we would do if we were in his shoes, maybe, they think, take vengeance on us for our prior sin. They sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers. So they're pleading, right? They're there. Their only defense is to appeal to the mercy of their judge. Verse 19, Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I provide for you and for your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Is this not what Jesus does for us? You see, Joseph himself even recognized an analogy between the rule and reign of the Lord that would ultimately be fulfilled and pictured in the Messiah to come, and his own obligation to extend forgiveness and provision to his pitiful brothers. On the basis of the sacrifice, the substitute sacrifice to come, this would be the Lord Jesus' attitude towards us. Do not fear, for I am the Son of God. What you meant for evil against me, one thinks of the sermon that Peter first preached. This man whom you crucified is the Son of God. And as he closes his message, what you meant as evil against him is the very propitiatory, that wrath-absorbing sacrifice that purchased your salvation. Turn from your sin. You meant it for evil. God has used it for good that many people should be kept alive today. In Joseph's case, 
that thousands should repent and come into the kingdom in the days of the early apostles. The royal communion of Joseph prefigures these events in the unconditional submission of the sinner, his brothers, in the unmistakable fulfillment of his rule and his kingdom, and also in the unselfish character, or you could say covenantal perspective of Joseph. Those, the brothers are concerned that they not be killed. What's Joseph's primary concern? It's interesting. It's for his brother and for his father. He inquired about their welfare, verse 27, and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. They bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. Most people, if fate had dealt you such a fortunate hand that after you know, being rejected and sold unjustly and treated so unfairly those many years ago, you rose to a position of power. Maybe you didn't have it in your heart to exact vengeance, but a lot of people would be of a mind that they would think not, they would put their past behind them and never think about it twice. Every memory that Joseph had in Egypt, if he walked in the flesh, would be a reminder and, and would something maybe you would just want to block out of his mind. Those brothers who sold me that, the place of my original homeland. You know what? I'm not even going to think about it anymore. I'm going to deal, my psychological crutch is going to be selective amnesia. I'm going to put the memory of the past behind me and all that traumatic stuff. I'm just going to focus on ruling this kingdom and enjoying this turn of affairs in my fortunes. This is not what Joseph did. Joseph was covenantally minded. He kept a perspective of the bigger picture of God's plan that would unfold through the covenant family and across the generations. And this partially accounts for his unselfish character. It's because he valued things bigger than his own immediate fortunes. His concern was for their father. Why? Because he was the covenant father. His concern was for his brother. Why? Because they were the covenant children. And he had in mind that God's purposes were to continue beyond this generation. He was not only concerned with his own legacy and the dash, as it were, on his own gravestone, that which he could experience. But instead, he knew that God had raised him up to save the, the covenant family from famine. This allowed him, this mindset, afforded Joseph a perseverance, a character, and consistency despite the drastic swings in fortunes. How was it that in jail he was running the place and exercising diligence, godly character, integrity, and responsibility even when he was at his lowest point? And then that same consistency of character enabled him and scaled to ruling the entire world insofar as he supplied them food at this time right here. Well, the stability of Joseph's life, the perseverance, character, and consistency of his uh, administration was due, I suggest, to this bigger picture perspective, that God was doing things far bigger than just himself, that despite the drastic swings in his uh, his fortunes, a covenantal worldview, gave him the grounding necessary for faithfulness in all things, whether he was a slave prisoner or the vizier of Pharaoh, which means grand steward. So when we contrast this with his brothers, it's quite striking. The rule and reign of Joseph is not selfish and opportunistic. When his brothers were in control of him, they cared nothing of the welfare of his father, nothing of the welfare of Joseph. Why? Because they did not have a covenantal view. They cared only of themselves, not the plan and purposes of God in the grand arc of redemptive history. No, but when Joseph, when he rose to rule and authority, his reign and his legacy was characterized by the idea that he was a small and faithful servant in God's big picture plan. This certainly applies for us as well. If we look at the difficulties that we face and the swings in fortune in our own life, there's a lot of opportunity for discouragement and despair to be sure. And we might want to put that out of our mind and just focus on the best possible situation from my experience and my life. But this is to miss the big picture of God's purposes. And we can live in victorious obedience to Jesus Christ in all circumstances 
when we remember the grand arc of God's purposes. It's not ultimately about us. And our lived experience should not be the center of our existential universe. Instead, it's about his purposes and his plan. Perhaps you as a parent to raise up the next generation. That your children might serve him. To recognize that in spite of the situation we're in right now, nevertheless, Christ is Lord. And we will testify to the same, whether we are in prison or whether we are second in command. Lessons from Joseph's rule and reign. So royal communion reveals this unconditional submission. Inasmuch as the brothers were unworthy subjects, there was an unmistakable fulfillment of prophecy. And this was punctuated by Joseph's covenantal perspective and his character. Secondly, I suggest this communion feast reveals Joseph as a shepherd king. As we continue to see his heart for his brothers and the way that he runs his affair, or orders his life and affairs, we see this ideal of rulership exemplified well in Joseph's testimony. Verse 30, or verse 29, excuse me. He lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. And Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. And they served him by himself. It goes on to give a little bit of the cultural context of the, the way the meal was arranged. This morning's worship text was Psalm 23 for a reason. Psalm 23 lays out that ideal picture in poetic form of the great shepherd, the good shepherd. John chapter 10, Jesus, his rule is parallel with that of Joseph and exceeds it infinitely inasmuch as he is the good shepherd. In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If Joseph was your shepherd, provisionally in those days, you should not want. Why? Because he would lead you to his storehouses of grain that would, protect, that would preserve the known world at the time. In Psalm 23, he, the Lord, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. A personal, caring, intimate character of the shepherd who has a heart and a compassion for the sheep. Joseph likewise illustrated this kind of softness of heart, his care and concern for his brother. As far as I can tell, the last time he saw Benjamin, he was four years old. And now he sees him, you know, he's like about 26. It has to get confirmation because a lot of time has passed when he realizes it's his brother. Lord, be gracious to you, my son. May your fortunes not be like mine. May the Lord show kindness unto you. May your brothers treat you. You can imagine all the thoughts that are going through Joseph's head at the time. And because of his care and concern, because of his covenantal perspective, because of his love for God's purposes, even through the beloved covenant family and his blood brother, he is overwhelmed with emotions and has to leave. As we continue to see these parallels, we're reminded of the ancients. So this picture of a shepherd king is not unique to Scripture, although the inspiration began certainly in God's vision for the calling of a leader. You guys have seen that famous gold uh, funerary mask that King Tut's mummy was buried in, probably one of the most famous Egyptian artifacts. And kids, have you ever seen that? Shiny gold, super well-preserved, and there's crossed arms in front of the chest of the young king. He's got the weird long beard piece, right? Which uh, somebody knocked off one time and they got prosecuted for two years and put in jail and they had to glue it back on with honey. It's kind of a fun. Anyways, there's two things in his hands. One on one hand is a, a shepherd's crook and the other is a flail. And I did a little research this week. That flail, near as archaeologists, historians, historians, historians excuse me, can figure, is a um, harvest tool. And so they would flail a certain plants and be able to strip off uh, fruit or bark or maybe separate grain from the chaff and so forth. And then, of course, the shepherd's crook, more obvious, that would be your staff to lead and guide sheep. So the ideal for leadership, as pictured by that King Tut, uh, is... A good leader is one who shepherds the people and provides for them. And Joseph, I suggest, aside from Jesus Christ himself, was the best picture in the ancient times of this kind of rule. Not only did he provide abundance for his nation, but because the Spirit of God was inside of him and he followed the word and will of God, he was able to provide 
for the entire world at the time. So that's on the flail side, but also on the uh, shepherding side, his care and concern and his compassion and his personal, um, even his idea to have this feast, to host his brothers, speaks to this uh, selfless laying down of the life of the shepherd king to serve the purposes that God has ordered. So yes, he has authority, and yes, he exercises it. Yes, he has responsibility, and he is called to answer for that, and so he rules the land. But on the same hand, he does so sacrificially because of his love, care, and concern for those who are in his charge. Those who want to be great in the kingdom of God, Jesus says, need to be the servant of all. Jesus is the model king. There's those parallels we've been noticing between the rule of Joseph and Jesus. But consider our Lord. What was the provision that he offered? The good shepherd, the greatest, Jesus himself, offers not just abundant storehouses of our daily bread, but his own body and blood as the provision necessary unto eternal life. So next week is our communion Sunday, and there will be a royal feast before us, pictured, symbolized in the elements. The elements themselves picture the provision of our good shepherd. The shepherd king, Jesus Christ, provides and leads his people, and he does so at the cost of his own body and blood. This shepherd king ideal is prefigured in Joseph. It anticipates a Messiah to come who would be the greatest of all shepherds. And we see this reflected in Joseph's words, be gracious to you, to, uh, you, my son. God, be gracious to you, my son. And these words are punctuated with this overwhelming compassion, so much so that Joseph's emotions overwhelm him and he retreats. He finds a place in his chambers to weep. He finally gathers himself and returns. And the narrator, uh, uh, you know, Moses lays out this dramatic set of circumstances in such a striking way. He washed his face, came out, controlling himself. He said, <clears throat> you can almost see him clear in his throat. There's a little redness conspicuous around his eyes. He's blinking a little bit more than you otherwise would expect. Serve the food, he says. And at this point, the brothers are still even more confused. Is he angry? Is he crying? What's going on? What they would soon realize is they're witnessing the heart of a shepherd king filled with the Holy Spirit who would offer to them reconciliation and also provision from famine, a picture of Jesus to come. Finally, this morning, royal communion re reveals not just the unconditional submission of the subjects, the brothers, not just the shepherd king's heart of Joseph, but his sovereign privilege that speaks to his authority and again to his rule and reign. And we see this especially towards the end in several ways and interesting ones at that. Verse 32, they served him, that is Joseph, his servants served Joseph by himself and them, his brothers by themselves. So two separate eating areas. The Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that was an abomination to the Egyptians. So in the situation, the, it's interesting because the brothers are set up with, uh, are here and there's obvious disparities. Though they are favored by the king, they don't enjoy the same privileges of eating with the Egyptians. So there's something of a cultural alienation in the way the table is set. Over here you have the foreigners, and over here you have the Egyptian and his countrymen. This sort of alienate, cultural alienation. It reminds us of typological distinctions and privileges in the Old Testament order before the Jew and Gentile middle wall was removed in Christ. That is to say, cultural distinctive, distinctives in the ceremonial law would continue under the administration of Moses. Those who were outsiders in the newly constituted nation of Israel would not have the same privileges of those who were of the seed of Abraham or had converted to the Jewish faith, as it were. And this was often resented. It, it, it's an opportunity or temptation for many people to resent the distinctions, the discrimination, if you will, of the holy, of the privileged, and of the unholy. And though, again, this rails, these kinds of differences rail against our cultural sensibilities today. And the brothers had opportunity to resent them even here. Will they submit to God's sovereignly instituted disparities and distinctions? Or, they, or will they resent the fact 
that they don't get to sit at the Egyptians' table. Well, the brothers are relieved. They, they, they are just breathing a sigh of relief. They don't really care about this at all. It doesn't even enter their mind. And this is obviously so, because the grace of guilt has shown them. Oh, to be a bird, like uh, David says, and to, to dwell in the house of the Lord. I think of the prodigal son returning. Let me be a servant in the house of my master. This is the heart of one who realizes they aren't entitled and their human rights to anything when they come before the sovereignty of their Lord and Creator, especially when they have fallen short, transgressed His holy law rebelliously and intentionally over and over again. They are to submit to Him and to be His servant. Lord, I have nothing to advocate, no rights on which to stand. I will submit to your will. Now, the other hand, on the other hand, think of the situation of Cain and Abel. The resentment of God's favor of Abel's sacrifice by Cain moved him to murderous uh, actions. And likewise, the brothers of Joseph, they resented Joseph privileging one over another. And that moved them to murderous jealousy as well eventually selling their brother into slavery. But their hearts are changing. Although this disparity still exists, even greater now, and they will soon see their brother is in fact second in command. Nevertheless, the circumstances are such that they realize their guilt and, they, that the fa- and the fact that they are unworthy subjects and they're happy to be in the presence of the king, even though they don't sit in the exact same spot as everybody else does. Now, God had purposes sovereignly in this sort of cultural distinctives and alienation, if you will. When the family eventually relocates, they take refuge in Goshen. Why? Well, multiple reasons. One of the first ones would be because of the Egyptian um, the cultural norms and the expectations, that separation was probably required. They didn't want foreigners to intermingle with them. But we also mentioned that this was ultimately God's purposes. We saw in Judah's life in chapter 38 that when he began to intermingle in pagan ways and fraternize with the nations around, it led to great dysfunction and led to great sin within his family. And thus God had sovereignly ordered through some of these circumstances, distinctions and alienation, the grace of exile, we called it, where being separated from the peoples would actually preserve them the line of the Messiah and the revelation of the Messiah rather than being watered down and compromised by uh, an unequal yoking with pagan peoples. So this sovereign privilege of the Lord ultimately and that Joseph exercised, we see purposes in every detail. We also see a sort of foreshadowing or parallel of personal election in the seating of the brothers. They sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. So you can see it, right, in the line all the way down this long table. We have Reuben at the top, and then everyone's arranged according to age until you get to Benjamin. Well, these are all adult men at this point. How in the world does this guy know? They turn to one another. They're just bewildered. They're rubbing our eyes. How is it that we are seated in this way? Joseph has uh, seated them and arranged them with a sovereign particularity. He's taking a personal, interactive interest in even the way that they're sitting at this table. And at this table, they're arranged, as the text tells us, according to the oldest, who ordinarily would have the birthright, and all the way down to the youngest. But then something surprising happens. Five portions go to one of these. Is it the oldest according to his birthright? No, it's the youngest, according to the favor of Joseph. So Benjamin gets five times the portion. It's a picture of favor. We can see multiple things going on here. Uh, God's, the axiom in the kingdom of God, that the last will be the first and the first will be the last. Matthew 19, 30, uh, chapter 20, 14 through 16, Jesus gives instructions and parables along these lines. The favor and the kindness and the grace of the Lord is not according to the formulas or calculations of men. It might appear counterintuitive to us, but in as much as it is, It represents a test of faith in God's sovereign power, in God's particular care, and God's right to pay the wages, uh, the same wages to all the workers, no matter when they repent, 
whether, whether they came to Christ at the earliest age possible or they were the thief on the cross, whether uh, Benjamin, the youngest, gets five portions or it's directed towards the more culturally appropriate oldest uh, according to his birthright. No, there was a time when the brothers absolutely resented this kind of personal favoritism. Well, is this not why they wanted to kill Joseph in the first place? This younger brother who does half the work as us, it's not fair that he should get a coat of many colors. But note how their heart has changed. Their little brother gets five times the portion. Are they upset? No. Benjamin's portion was five times as much as theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. They're grateful just to be in the house of the king because the grace of guilt has brought them to a place of an understanding and a sober self-assessment of where they stand and what they deserve and the fact that they are entitled to nothing and can only plead on the basis of the mercy of the sovereign. This particular grace comes to the fore in the gospel and Paul speaks directly to it. Let's close by referencing a parallel in Romans chapter 9. The book of Romans is tough sledding for many people, primarily because of that radical autonomy I told you about before. It doesn't seem fair to us in the, con the, the God of our uh, choosing, which is just a figment of our imagination, that he would show particular love on some and pass over others. Nevertheless, in the mystery of God's sovereign purposes, this is the way that things unfold. In Romans, 4, or Romans 9, verses 14, Paul says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And it goes on to argue against the possible objections to God's sovereign purposes in his particular grace, the sovereignty of his grace. Do we have a problem with the way that God favors his elect? Why were we chosen and not our neighbor if our neighbor is indeed destined to hell? These questions we will die without a clear answer to because the answers are within the mystery of God's sovereign purposes. We are but unworthy subjects. We have no right to demand that God interact with us on our terms. Who are we to say to the potter, why have you formed me this way? No, the right attitude to have in considering the favor of the Lord towards us his saved ones, is to remember that we are but unworthy subjects. And at that royal communion table of the Lord, the reason that we are in his favor and fellowship is because Jesus died for wicked sinners such as us. We are not worthy of his presence, but he has extended to us that grace and mercy according to his sovereign will. So remember again these words of the great hymn and prepare your hearts this week as an application of this message to come to the Lord's table uh, in, in seven days. The Rock of Age, or as the uh, great hymn, Rock of Ages, reminds us, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to that cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, hopeless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Let us close in prayer. We thank you, Father, that through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our sins have washed, been washed away in his blood. At the royal communion table of your presence and fellowship and friendship, we recognize that we are unworthy subjects. Lord, we have nothing to bring that rises above the level of pitiful insult in our works or in ourselves. But we are throwing ourselves in the gospel upon the mercy of our judge. And when we open our eyes after kneeling in prayer before him, realizing that he died in our place. What glorious joy fills our hearts at the table of the Lord. Lord, I pray that these, uh, that these gospel reminders would move us to the heart that we ought to have in approaching with joy and reverence your table next week. And I pray if there are any lost in the hearing of this message, 
that the convicting word of guilty would go forth until they find rest and peace in Jesus Christ, who is raised for our justification, who is offered up for our transgressions, and therefore justified, having been justified by faith in that and what Jesus has done, we have peace with you. May this message go forth from your church as a result of this sermon today, that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.